I'm very thankful. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 this morning. Acts chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 41 through 47. Acts 2, 41 through 47. This week I was reflecting on Easter and uh, the awesome day that we had. Um, There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and, you know, we had been preparing for Easter service and and praying about it and getting excited about it and it finally came. And I I, I just got to say publicly, I just want to praise God for the service we had last week. I thought it was was excellent. I, I think the Lord really blessed our service last week. If you weren't able to be here, you really missed. The presentation went really well. Uh, nothing embarrassing happened or unbiblical, so that was whew, that was a relief for me because you never know when you invite people in to do stuff, what they're going to say and what they're going to do. So that was a blessing. Uh, we had a ton of visitors in church. That was a huge blessing. We've been praying on Wednesday nights that we would have visitors and that people would come in and hear the gospel and God answered that prayer. We had a, a, a boatload of visitors. And many of you invited friends and family and coworkers to the Easter service. And that was a, a huge encouragement to me. And then our fellowship time afterwards, I thought, was really great. The, not only was the food good, but it was just a sweet time of singing together. And I actually like the acoustics in that room over there. It actually sounds really good when we sing in there. Here we have these grand high ceilings and the singing can be a little subdued over there. It was really, really good. So, but I, I'm I'm very thankful for how Easter went, and it kind of made me. It was it was so climactic, and to me emotionally, it kind of made me say like, "What do I preach on now?" Like it was so good. What do we do now? You know, and uh, Easter the Easter season is over, but you know, church ministry has to go on. And what should I preach on? So I was. I was praying about it, and of course, I've been preaching through Amos, and so I was planning on picking that back up today, Um, but I knew being with Pastor Gone that I was preaching twice today, and I didn't really want to do Amos morning and night, so I was just praying about what to do, and I was just thinking about the the excitement of Easter and then ministry after a period of excitement, and as I thought about that, I began to think about what it must have been like for Jesus' disciples, right? Right? They, they experienced all of that, right? They, they experienced three and a half years of Christ's ministry. And if you read the Gospels, Christ's ministry was a whirlwind, right? They were going everywhere busily, and there was crowds following them, and Jesus was teaching and preaching and healing people and performing miracles. And it was a very exciting, exciting ministry. And, of course, it culminate, uh, you know, culminated with the Last Supper and then Christ's crucifixion, which for the disciples would have been a very confusing and scary experience and very deeply bothersome. And then a few short days after the crucifixion, of course, the resurrection. And so the disciples go from extreme sadness and anguish and disappointment that, you know, they they abandoned Christ. They didn't stay with him during the trial and he was crucified and, and all that happened. And now he's buried and then he rises again and he appears to them. And he even eats food with them, and, and he's, he's with them. And, and so they went from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs, and it was just a very amazing experience. Then Christ is on earth for quite a period of time, but a few weeks later, then Jesus, they get to physically watch Jesus ascend into heaven. Wow. Talk about intensity. And, and as I was thinking about them and, and the emotions of their life and their ministry, realize these are people who their whole life revolved around the ministry of Christ, and they just watched Christ go up into heaven. I couldn't help but imagine that possibly some of them had this emotion, what now? What are we going to do now? Jesus is gone. But there was some good news Fortunately, Jesus had told them what to do next. He didn't just leave them. He gave them some instruction. He said, stay in Jerusalem and you're going to receive power from me. And then you're going to go and be witnesses all over the world. If you study the New Testament, you will you will realize through the gospel and the book of Acts and the epistles that what the disciples were doing was they were actually just continuing Jesus ministry on the earth. 
So Jesus was here, they learned, they studied under him, and when Jesus ascended, they went out and continued Christ's ministry on the earth, but they continued it through the vehicle of the church. So Christ's ministry was continued through the vehicle of the church. This is why the day of Pentecost was really important. Because what Jesus did at the day of Pentecost, most of you know the story, was all of the disciples received the Holy Spirit in a permanent indwelling way. So Jesus didn't just like leave, you know, like imagine a CEO of a company. You know, you hear about these people that found a company and they're the leader and the company's doing great. And then they make enough money and they're just like, all right, I'm retiring. See you guys later. I'm going to go live on an island. You just, you know, you can take over the company. Just do whatever you want. You know, Jesus didn't do that. At Pentecost, his Holy Spirit came into believers. And so now the Holy Spirit is empowering the disciples to continue the ministry of Jesus Christ. So that's what we see at the day of Pentecost, and that's what we see, but they have these instructions on what to do. Stay in Jerusalem until you're endued with power, and then you're going to be witnesses to me, to the whole world. So luckily they didn't have that feeling, what do we do now? They may have had it, but they knew because Jesus had told them. So we're about to get into this passage, and what we're picking up in Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost, it just happened, and, and Peter had just preached, and 3,000 people got saved. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, that's amazing. And then we're going to pick up the passage here in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, and we're going to read through 47. It says, Then they gladly received his word, talking about Peter, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every, every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So what we see here is the, the resurrection happened, Jesus comes to earth and he ministers and then he ascends to heaven and now we're seeing what's next what is life going to be like after the resurrection and we're going to look here at four crucial aspects of church life four crucial aspects of church life as we study this passage as i study this what do they do after christ is gone and i ran across this passage and i identified seven different categories here of things they're doing what is the church doing now that Christ is gone? So I was going to preach a seven-point message. That was my initial plan. But I had pity on all of you, and I said, you know what? I don't want to see that many sleeping faces when I'm preaching, so I'm going to break this up. So this morning we're looking at four, and if you come back tonight, we'll get the other three aspects that we're going to see, aspects, uh, crucial aspects of church life. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll jump into the passage. Lord, we're thankful that your ministry is still going on in the lives of believers in the vehicle of the church. And Lord, as we look at this passage and we see at the very beginning of the church how they ministered and how they lived out your mission, Lord, help us to assess ourselves if in our own lives if we are doing these things, if we are prioritizing these things. Lord, we want to be a biblical church. We want to continue your mission here in our community. Help us now as we study this passage. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. So we're going to look through this passage and identify some of the things that the early church was doing after the ascension, these crucial aspects of their ministry. If you're taking notes this morning, the first thing we see is preaching. Preaching. Look back at verse 14 of Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, 
So this was a miracle. God performed this miracle, and the Holy Spirit came on these people. They're speaking in tongues, and they have the, the, this, this miraculous symbol over their heads. This is a once-in-a-lifetime experience, and this is, this is the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the church, the Holy Spirit coming to dwell on these people permanently. And after this happens, Peter stands up, and what does he do? He doesn't just talk, or he doesn't just uh, give them a five steps for a better life. No, he preaches to them. The church was founded on preaching. Preaching is crucial for local church ministry. Preaching is crucial for evangelism. Romans 10, 13 through 15 says, For whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. In church ministry, in our lives, in the ministry of Christ, preaching is crucial. It's crucial for evangelism. Preaching is also crucial for church growth, for spiritual growth. For spiritual growth. Second Timothy chapter four, verses two through three says, This is Paul talking to Timothy, who is a pastor. He says, Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. We see in this passage that Preaching is meant to reprove, rebuke, exhort. That means it's meant to deal with you as at your heart level to say, hey, you have these issues. To say, hey, this is a direction you need to head to encourage you and challenge you to live for God. This is all the things that preaching does, and this is crucial for our spiritual growth. We all need to be under preaching. Preaching was a primary aspect of Christ's ministry. He spent a lot of time teaching, but he also spent a lot of time preaching. And preaching is just faithfully proclaiming the truths of Scripture. As we continue Christ's ministry here in this church, we must continue proclaiming God's Word. I'm afraid that in many churches the preaching has been compromised. And often in many churches, it's not what is being said that the, is the problem. The problem is what is not being said. In Acts 27, Paul told the church that he preached to them the whole counsel of God. What did he mean in that statement? What he was saying is that Paul did not withhold any topic or any aspect of Scripture when he taught them and when he preached to them. He preached the whole Bible. He didn't avoid anything. And I'm afraid that nowadays in the church, people are avoiding topics that people don't like. Folks, in today's culture, it's not popular to preach about sin, about repentance, about hell. It's not popular to preach about homosexuality. It's not popular to preach about the roles in the family. There are a lot, a lot of things that it's not popular. And do you know that some pastors and some churches, they've just taken the high road and said, you know what? We're going to try to reach more people, so we're just not going to talk about those things. It is so important for our ministry here at Calvary Baptist Church that we elevate biblical preaching. One of the best guardrails against issues in preaching is preaching through a book. Now, that doesn't solve all the problems, but it really helps because guess what? When you're like, I'm preaching through Amos right now, and I, I have to preach the next verse. Now, I could technically skip, but I would hope if I skipped some verses, some of you would come up and grab me afterwards and say, what do you, why did you do that? What are you skipping verses for? Because I've already told you, I'm preaching through the whole Bible. That's a good guardrail, and that's helpful. But that's not the only thing. It's just an attitude that says, when I come up here, my goal, and Pastor Snyder's goal, is to preach the Word of God. That is our goal. And it's so important. When I was growing up, I grew up in church. I remember there was people in our church who would come to church and they would be part of the service. And as soon as the preaching started, they would get up and go out to the back. 
And that all, and, and there was a couple of them. They would always go out and they would just chit chat in the back. And then right when the invitation was happening, they come back down and, and sit sit out. I was like, what in the world? I don't understand that. Obviously, they had some kind of issue, and it wasn't a health problem because they had they had been you know sitting in sermons for a long time. They just decided they didn't want to hear that preaching anymore. That's crazy. That's like going to Burger King and saying, I want a double Whopper with no meat on it. You wouldn't do that. You, you just order a salad, right? That's what a salad is. When you come into church, preaching is a priority here at Calvary Baptist Church. What we do in this ministry is built to support and to utilize the preaching. Preaching is central. It's not everything we do. We do a lot of other things. We're, there are seven of them I'm going to talk about today. But preaching is a priority, and it needs to be central to our ministry. What we do around here, the music, our fellowship, our fellowship afterwards, it should be supporting and building off the preaching of God's Word. This is not about who's standing up here preaching. It's about the truth that's being proclaimed. Preaching should not be focused on entertaining you and and being enjoyable. Now, preaching can be entertaining. That's good. It can be enjoyable. That's good. But that's not the focus or the goal. Preaching is the goal of preaching is to faithfully proclaim the word of God. And so that is important. And we see that it was very important for the early church. Preaching was central to the early church and to the ongoing ministry of Christ. Let's look at the second thing this morning, and that is teaching. Look at turn over to verse 42. It says in verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What does that mean, to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine? Well, I think it meant that they were listening to the apostles. They were studying what the apostles were teaching them. They were discussing it. They were teaching it and being taught by the apostles the truths of doctrine. Teaching is very important because we need smaller group settings where people can ask questions, they can talk through issues, they can, an- they can have questions answered that they, can, that they have. That's part of teaching. And, and I believe teaching can be done in many forms. We can have, uh, like I mentioned, uh, I think I mentioned, Sunday school is a, is a teaching time. That's a good way. One-on-one discipleship, uh, group discipleship, group Bible studies. Um, it, informally, we can have teaching times in our conversations. I know I've learned things from many of you just in conversing after church. So teaching doesn't have to have a formal setup, but it needs to be happening here in our church. It must be happening. See, there's a primary distinction between preaching and teaching. I've always heard good preaching has a little bit of teaching, and good teaching has a little bit of good you know, preaching in it. And I think that's a true statement. But as I thought about it, there's really a distinct difference in that good teachers are pursuing the comprehension of their students. Here's what I mean by this. When I stand up here and preach, I'm really not paying attention to whether you're getting what I'm saying or not. You know, at any point in time when I'm standing here preaching, some of you look mad, some of you look happy, some of you are sleeping, and some of you look hungry, you know, and that none of that is going to adjust how I preach. Because I'm just going to stand up here, and with God's help, I'm going to proclaim the Word of God, right? That's not so in a teaching environment. It should not be so. Teachers should slow their teaching to the pace of comprehension. And so a good teacher reads the room, reads the responses, asks questions, and says, aren't these people getting this stuff? Because if you're just teaching something and nothing is landing, you probably should stop, back up, reword it, ask questions, answer questions, and help people understand. Do you see the difference there? Good teaching slows down, and the, the goal of good teaching is learning. It's not just speaking. So I'm not worried about that right now. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. I hope you understand my points. I hope you're thinking about the passage. But my goal is proclaiming the Word of God. But in our church, we need formats and settings where you can slow down, you can ask questions, you can get clarity, and we can learn and grow from one another. 
Biblically, the Bible says that teaching is not just to be done by the pastor or the deacons in a church. Second Titus talks about the older women are to teach the younger. And it kind of implies in that passage, it talks about the younger men. It's implying the older men needs to teach the younger men. So we need this in our church. We need each other to be teaching each other and learning. And we need an atmosphere where as we're learning, the teacher is going along at the pace of comprehension. I remember when I was in high school, I, it was in Bible. I went to a Christian school for most of my life, and I was in a Bible class, and my Bible teacher turned on a video. And I had actually seen that video in my youth group, like the week before. So I thought to myself, this would be a good time to catch up on my sleep. I'm not... I'm not ad, ad, you know, advocating for this. Okay, this was like ninth grade. But uh, so I said, okay, I'm just going to take a nap. So I put my head down and I fell asleep. So when the bell rang and the, the video was over, the teacher said, wait a second. Well, the bell hadn't rang. He said, wait, the movie was over. He said, wait a second. Before you all leave, since Mr. Tyson decided to take a nap, we're going to have a pop quiz. So he said, take out a sheet of paper. So everybody took out a sheet of paper and he gave us 10 quiz questions from the video. And so we, sw we switched papers and we graded it. We handed it back to each other. And I got 100%. And my friend said to me, what would you get on that quiz? I said, I got 100. He goes, you just hurt my grade because you're sleeping and I did terrible on that quiz. They were so mad at me. They were so upset. I was not a very popular guy. But I thought it was hilarious. But what did my teacher do there? He said, one of my terrible students is sleeping, and I want to teach him a lesson from this so that he pays attention, so that he's getting the information and actually learning what we're talking about. Do you see what I'm saying? Is teaching has a goal of comprehension. And so it's, it's very different than preaching. And yet they both have their place. Now, I'm not going to give you a pop quiz today, so you can all breathe easy. No pop quiz. Because I'm preaching, I'm not teaching. And uh, the Sunday school teachers, they don't usually give very many quizzes. But the point is this. In our ministry here, and we see in the early church, all throughout the New Testament, that teaching was important. So I want to ask you this morning, are you getting teaching? Or are you just getting preaching? If you're not getting teaching, I would encourage you to come and attend a Sunday school class. Come and attend our Bible studies. Come and get involved in discipleship. Whatever it takes, we need teaching in our lives. You and I need it. We need to be both teaching each other and learning from others. And we need it here in our ministry. This was rarely where Jesus spent the bulk of his time, didn't he? Teaching his disciples. And so if we're going to continue Christ's ministry, if that's our goal, to continue Christ's ministry, teaching has to be central in our ministry here. Let's look at the third thing this morning, and that is fellowship. Fellowship. Look back at verse 42. It says, And they continued steadfastly, I like that word, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, I know in a Baptist church, when we say the word fellowship, we think casseroles. That is our association. That's at least I do. I think potluck equals fellowship. And that's good. You know, we also, maybe you think about just joking and telling stories or, or just laughing together. And those things are all good, but those are just parts of what fellowship is. That's not the whole thing. You've probably heard about the Greek word here is koinonia. And the idea here is not just getting together and eating food. It's the idea of having a community. It's community relationship. It also carries the word of joint participation. So when we fellowship together, we're not just hanging out. We're working together towards a goal. Look down at verse 44. It says, And all that believed were together and had all things in, in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now, people have used this verse to try to advocate for socialism. That's not what this is talking about. This was a completely voluntary thing that people did. But what is this saying? It's saying that they, 
the, the early church, they had such a love and a care for each other that they not only spent time together, but they shared their resources. They had close relationships. Their church relationships were of great importance in their lives. And they happily sacrificed for each other out of love for each other and out of love for God. While baking a casserole and getting together and telling stories is fellowship, and that's good, that's not all that fellowship is. Biblical fellowship is doing life together as a local church. I believe we sometimes struggle with this in our culture because we're very private people, aren't we? We only share what we want to share about each other. We're very selective in what we let people know about us. We make sure that our house is clean if somebody comes in. We, we compartmentalize our life into sections. I don't see that here. I see a community who's invested and committed to loving each other. And their focus is not on each category of their life. Their focus is on the church. It's on the body of Christ. I love to see the way that our church spends time together. I, I'm thankful here, if you stick around, that we have, I believe we have a sweet spirit of fellowship. If you stick around after a regular service, most, you know, some of you cannot for different reasons, and I understand that. But if you stick around after a service, there's usually people out here for 30, 40 minutes talking, getting to know each other, laughing, encouraging each other. And, and that encourages my heart. I'm so thankful for that. And I just want to help you practically this morning that if in your mind you budget church an extra 30 minutes afterwards, you'll have a great opportunity. And I know some of you are hungry. I, I get that. But if you budget in your mind an extra 30 minutes, you have a great opportunity to fellowship with one another right here after the service. I've been in churches where when the pastor says amen, it's like somebody you know, boom, shot the gun at the, the firing line, and everybody's racing to the buffet, you know. And, and I don't see that so much here. I, I, I'm thankful that we hang around. But this is important. It's important that we're building relationships and that we're fellowshipping with each other. We cannot obey this, this principle of church fellowship unless we're investing time and energy into our relationships. Biblical fellowship requires relationship. It doesn't mean that you have to be best friends with everybody here and spend 100% of your time, you know, investing in every person's room. That's not what it is. But we should be striving in this ministry to be a blessing to each other. That's really what we see in this passage, is when these people, when the church began, they had an outward focus at loving and blessing each other. And that was based around their relationship. The relationship is the foundation of fellowship. I had a friend who really struggled talking with people. And my friend, he's about my age, he really, really, he didn't have very many friends. And, and his issue was he had a, a, a rough upbringing at home. And so he just didn't learn a lot of the social skills that we learn when we interact with each other. And um, he would try to talk to people, but he would ask very inappropriate questions. And he didn't realize they were inappropriate. I remember um, the first time he came over to our house, he walked in and he said, I like your apartment. How much do you pay for rent? I told him, but that was awkward. And then I remember I, uh, my cousin came down and we were fishing and I took my friend fishing and he went, he, he went, said to my cousin, he said, I love your boat. How much did you pay for it? You know, he just didn't realize the, the privacy there, the, the awkwardness of that. That was how he was trying to begin conversation. But he really struggled, and people didn't respond well to his awkward questions, right? So he didn't really have friends, and he really struggled. And so I really wanted to try to help him. And so I came up with some practical advice, and I'm going to take a few minutes this morning and share it. And the reason I'm sharing this is because, especially nowadays, many of us, we struggle with this, don't we? Some of us really struggle just having a conversation. We don't know how to have a basic conversation. And a basic conversation is the foundation of a relationship. And a relationship is the foundation of this fellowship that's going on right here. 
So if, if, if you want to jot down a couple of things here, I'm just going to give you some real practical advice on this, on this idea of communication real quick. Okay, the first step is introduce yourself, okay? If you don't know somebody, when you go up to talk to them, tell them your name. Sounds simple, but that's important, right? They need to know your name. That's step one. The second thing is ask a question about them so you can get to know them. You know what I have found is, in general, is that people love talking about themselves. In general. Not everybody. Some people don't want to talk. But in general, people love to talk about themselves. So when you're getting to know somebody, ask them questions about themselves. And then here's the third step. Once they've told you, then ask them if they like or dislike whatever they're talking about. You say, why would you do that? Well, this is how you learn about people. We need to grow and learning. Friendship and relationship is built on what you know about somebody. So it's important to ask them, what do you like? What do you not like? Learning somebody's dislikes and likes is a foundation of relationship. And then the, the next step is listen to what they say. So often when we're having conversations, we're thinking about what we want to say next. And we're not, we don't even care what they're actually saying. We're just preparing for how the next thing we're going to say. It's important as we're communicating with each other that we learn and grow in this area of listening. Listen to what the person has to say. And then this is an important step. Step five is share about yourself and what you like and dislike. Here's what happens so often. Either A, somebody doesn't want to share about themselves. So you're trying to talk to them, and it's like pulling teeth just to get them to tell you about themselves. That's hard. Or B, all they want to do is talk about themselves, and they don't want to talk about you at all. Well, that's not a very good conversation, is it? Because a, a good relationship goes both directions. And so sometimes people, they love to talk to other people about that person. You know, I love asking questions, but they never share about themselves. So this is just practically, and, and I took my friend, and I sat him down, and I explained all these things to him. And you know what he said to me? He goes, no one's ever told me this. I've never known how to carry on a conversation. So some of you are looking at me like I have four, four heads right now. And you may be thinking, why are you talking about this? I'm talking about this because there are people in this room who really struggle carrying on a conversation. And carrying on a conversation, us communicating with each other, is so important if we're going to have fellowship. We have to learn how to talk and enjoy each other's company and learn about each other. I can't know about your struggles and your needs and your hopes and your dreams unless you tell me. And you're not going to tell me unless I ask. And so this, these simple steps are important for us here at Calvary Baptist Church. When you go through the New Testament and you look at Jesus' ministry, he often goes to somebody and asks them questions. Didn't Jesus know everything already? He did. He knew everything already. He didn't have to ask any questions. But he would go to people and ask them questions and converse with them, and he built a relationship with people. And this is important for us today. So I'm talking about these basics of communication and conversation because these are important for fellowship. And biblical fellowship, we see in this passage, this idea of us being a community where we love each other, we share our time and our resources and our burdens, this is important. And this is all part of us continuing Christ's ministry. Let's look at the fourth and final thing this, this morning is fourth thing. The final things will be tonight. But the fourth thing this morning is prayer. Look again at verse 42. It says, and the breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued steadfastly in prayers. Praying communicates that we believe God is in control. Do you believe God's in control? I hope you do. When we pray, we're communicating that God cares about what's going on in our lives and in our ministry. Praying communicates that we need God's grace in our lives. I need God's grace in my life. So when I go to God in prayer, it's saying, God, I need you. 
We pray because we have a dependence on God for his help. Prayer is a crucial aspect of our church life. There's so much that can be said about prayer. I mean, you could literally preach a whole year, every sermon on prayer. The scripture is full of prayers from different people and and admonition about prayer, and there's so much. So I'm not going to try to tackle too much this morning. I just want to think about a couple aspects about prayer, and and we'll close. I want to think specifically this morning about praying for each other in this context of church life. I am fearful that the most common lie told in this building is, I am praying for you, or I will pray for you. Folks, we should not utter those words unless we are going to pray for that person. Because if we do that, if we just throw that out flippantly, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you, and we don't actually do it, then that totally loses meaning. So we need to be careful in this area that when we say to each other, hey, I'm going to pray for you about that, that we do our best to actually pray about it. One thing that may help is if you pray for somebody and you're truly concerned about the burden they share with you, is go follow up with them. That means the next week, go find them and say, hey, I prayed for your interview, I prayed for your surgery, I prayed for your nephew's illness. What's the latest on that? That's a good way to help you remember to pray for them and also to let them know that you actually did pray for them. Here's another trick that's very, very helpful is if we're here at church and somebody shares something with you that's a burden on their heart, consider praying for them right then. Okay? Now, I'm not saying make a, a spectacle. You know, when we're out here fellowshipping, they don't be, excuse me, everybody, we need to pray for them right now. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's really easy to, you can see somebody's burden, you can see somebody's hurting, to pull them aside, pull them back in the auditorium, pull them off the side and say, let's pray right now. This is great. Okay, this is really something we need to do more of. It's really good because you're guaranteed that you did pray for them at least one time when you do that. Because you're praying with them. It's also really helpful because it is encouraging when you're burdened and you share that burden with your brother or sister in Christ here at church. And they take the time to stop right there and talk to God on your behalf. That's a blessing. And that's very helpful. I think that's one... One uh, tip I could give us is we can grow in this area. Let's pray for each other right away when we hear something serious is going on. There's one more way that we can keep prayer important here in the life of our church. It's really simple. Attend Wednesday night prayer meeting. Most of you, a lot of you do. And, And some of you may not even know that on Wednesday nights, we come together here in this room and we pray for each other. We take prayer requests, we share requests, and we pray for each other. In a group setting, we pray for each other. This is a great opportunity for you to have your burdens prayed about by your church family. And it's a great opportunity for you to come and pray for other people's burdens. You say, yeah, but you don't understand how busy my week is. You want me to come to church three times a week? Yes, yes I do. Look down at verse 46. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. In one form or the other, the early church was getting together every day. Now, I'm not advocating for that. I love you guys, but not that much. I don't want to see you every day, okay? We, th- this is a different culture in a different world. I'm not advocating we get together every single day. But the point is this. The point is this. They spent an extensive amount of time together. We know from history that they met on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. We also know that in that time period, Sunday was a work day. So what the early church would do on Sundays is they would get together. Remember, many of the early church were slaves So they would get together on Sunday morning and worship and eat a meal and sing and preach and teach. And then they would go to work all day. And then when work was over on Sunday, they would get together again. Now you think our current Sundays are exhausting. That would have been exhausting. But they did it gladly. 
because they saw the importance of the fellowship, the community, the preaching, and the teaching, and the prayer. And so they got together on a regular basis. In this passage, it says, in one form or the other, they were together like every day. So I would like to see you here on Wednesday night. And I'm so thankful we have a great group, many of you, who are faithfully here on Wednesday nights praying. And I, and I, I recognize the sacrifice of that, that you work hard that day and you are tired. And I believe me, it does not go. I, I worked a regular job. I know exactly how it feels when you get home from work and all you want to do is put your feet up. And so I am encouraged every Wednesday night when I stand up here to take prayer requests and I look out and I see a great group of people who are sacrificing to be here and be part of the body and be praying. If prayer is important, then Wednesday night prayer meeting is important. And I'm so thankful for the meeting we have. And I recognize some of you work second shift and some of you have other issues and you can't make it. I, I, I respect that and I understand. But for those of us who are able... What a great opportunity to pray, to fellowship, to hear preaching, to do all these things. The great John R. Rice, a pioneer in fundamentalism, he had this statement, which I very much like. He said, all of our failures are prayer failures. We need prayer in this church. We need to be praying for each other on an individual basis. We need to be praying corporately. We need to be seeking God's face on behalf of ourselves, our loved ones, and this ministry. Let's continue steadfastly in prayer. So what now? Christ is risen. He ascended to heaven, and we're here to continue his work. How do we do that? What did we learn from this passage? We should keep preaching. We should keep teaching. We should keep fellowshipping. We should keep praying. And come back tonight, and we'll talk about three more things that we should keep doing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this group of people, this church family that we have. Lord, we're all sinners. We sometimes hurt each other. We have disagreements. Lord, we, we all have our issues. But, Lord, you brought us together as a family of Calvary Baptist Church. And we want to glorify you. Lord, we want to continue your ministry in the Coldwater and Quincy community. We want to be a place where people can come and be part of a family, where people can hear the truths of Scripture preached, where people can come and pray and fellowship. Lord, we know we are not doing these things perfectly. Lord, help us to make adjustments to learn and to grow so that we are the church that you want us to be. Lord, we want to be a shining light for you here in this area. Thank you for the good attention of the people. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts. Lord, if we have neglected our own lives in these areas, if we have neglected the church ministry in these areas, I pray that in the moments ahead, that your Holy Spirit would convict us and draw us to you, and Lord, help us in these areas. Bless us now as we meditate and pray on these things. I ask this in your Son's name. Amen. With every head bowed, I want to give us just one verse of the piano to think about our own lives. Are we prioritizing these things? Are these things important in our lives and in our ministry here?